We're going to talk about gravity and Newton's universal law of gravitation. So the question is, are planets the only objects with a gravitational force? What is the minimum mass required to get a gravitational force? Well, it actually does there is no minimum mass. Any object that has mass is going to any pair of objects that have mass will have a gravitational force between them. They, these forces act as an action and reaction pair. So if I have mass 1 and I have mass 2, the force of 2 on 1, 1 is going to be pulled towards 2, and 2 is going to be pulled towards 1. They have an equal and opposite force. This is Newton's third law. So let's say we have two particles, mass 1 and mass 2, separated by distance r. The gravitational force acts along a line joining them with the magnitude given by this equation. This equation is on your AP Physics 1 equation sheet, and it says the magnitude of gravity equals big G times m1 times m2 over r squared. Big G is a constant of universal gravitation, and you'll find that on your equation sheet. M1 is the first mass in uh, kilograms, M2 is the second mass in kilograms, and R is the distance between the centers of those two masses. So let's determine the force of gravitational attraction that the Earth, which has a mass of 5.98 times 10 to the 24th kilograms, that the Earth exerts on a 70 kilogram physics student if the student is standing at sea level, which is a distance of 6.38 times 10 to the 6 meters from the Earth's center. We're going to use the equation, and these are our givens, and let's plug them in and see what the force of gravity is. So D is a constant. This is the ma mass 1, which is the mass of the Earth, mass 2, which is the mass of the student, divided by the radius squared. We come up with 686 newtons. Well, in the past, we found the force of gravity, and it was just 9.8 times the mass in kilograms. And it gets us, gives us the same answer. Well, that's only going to work. This shorter version will only work at sea level, because if you change the radius, if you go up uh, into outer space, you'll have less gravitational force. So we need to know the equation because sometimes we're going to consider things that are in outer space or maybe orbiting a planet that doesn't have the mass of the Earth, so it doesn't have the same gravitational acceleration. So now that we know the force of gravity, let's determine the force of gravitational attraction that a student exerts on the Earth. So we know the Earth exerts this force on the student, so what does a student exert on the Earth? Well, it's going to be the same because the forces are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. So even though it doesn't feel like the Earth has that strong of a force towards you, it is the same. So what's different is the acceleration. The, since the masses of the person and the Earth are so different, the acceleration of the Earth towards you is going to be very, very small. But the force will be equal. So let's talk about the acceleration of gravity. Let's remember that a force is mass times acceleration. So that means the force of gravity is going to be the mass times the acceleration of gravity. We've used this before. Well, sometimes g is not 9.8 meters per second squared. So if we're going to consider different radiuses and possibly different masses, we're going to come up with a general rule for what the acceleration of gravity is. We're going to take the force of gravity defined here and divide it by the mass. And we come up with gravity is equal to the force of gravity over m or gravity equals g times m over r squared, where m is the mass of the, uh, the larger object that we're getting the acceleration of gravity from. The Earth's gravitational field, the m would be the mass of the Earth. So this is a more general definition for gravity when we're not at, the, at sea level. Gravitational field is another term we use to refer to the gravitational acceleration around an object. So gravitational field has the same definition as gravitational acceleration. The gravitational field on the surface of other planets, it's going to vary depending on the radius and the mass of the planet. So Mercury is um, smaller and 
less massive than the Earth, so it has a smaller gravitational field. On the other hand, Jupiter is much larger and much more massive, and it has a much larger gravitational field. So what happens to the, the gravitational field as we move away from an object? Well, it decreases, but not just uh, by 1 over r, but by 1 over r squared, which means if you move away, say this is right at sea level, that's going to be a distance of 1 radius. If you move to two times the radius of the, the Earth, you're going to find that your gravitational field is one-fourth the gravity at sea level. So it's an inverse function of the distance. As the distance from the center of the object increases, g decreases at a rate of 1 over r squared. So gravity will vary slightly throughout the surface of the Earth, and you can see from this picture that Especially along the mountains, you'll have a smaller gravitational. The red and orange area is going to be a smaller gravitational field. And as you get down to sea level, you'll have a larger gravitational field. Those are the blue areas. So how would the gravitational field change if you were at the top of Mount Everest? It will be less. So the last thing we're going to talk about is uh, orbits of planets and of satellites. So objects that orbit a planet or, or a star are actually objects that are in projectile motion. They're in free fall. If you, you consider from a very high point, you shoot, you throw a ball. If you throw it not too hard, it's going to eventually fall down to the Earth. If you throw it a little bit harder, it's going to go further, but still fall down. And a little bit further, path C, it keeps going. It can almost get around the planet, but then eventually falls down. But if you shoot it fast enough, you can cause an object to continue to travel. It gets pulled towards the Earth, but it keeps moving. It's fast enough that it doesn't fall to the Earth. So objects that are orbiting, they are in free fall. And we're going to treat them with our rules for circular motion because they are moving in a approximate circular path, even though sometimes it may be um, elliptical. So for a satellite orbiting a planet, we can treat it as circular motion. The gravitational force is what is keeping it pulled towards the center. So that's what's going to give it the centripetal force. And the velocity is tangent to the, to the, the movement. So if the centripetal force is going to be provided by the gravitational force, we can say that the centripetal force, which is the mass times the centripetal acceleration, equals this equation for the force of gravity. And now we can simplify this equation. The R's, one of, this R will cancel and this will become just R instead of R squared. The small mass will cancel from both sides. and you get to v squared equals gm over r. Simplify it further, you find that the velocity around an, uh, a planet is equal to the square root of g times the mass of that planet over the radius. And that's the radius where the satellite is, so that would be this distance here. The m is not the mass of the satellite. The m is the mass of the object that is being orbited, that's providing the gravitational force. So it would be the mass of the Earth or whatever, uh, whatever planet is being orbited. So here are some notes on orbital velocity. Looking at this equation, we'll note that the orbital velocity does not depend on the mass of the satellite. You can have a very large satellite, and it will not make a difference about in terms of the velocity. Orbital velocity will increase as the mass of the object that's being orbited, like the planet, increases. And orbital, orbital velocity will decrease as the distance from the center of the object increases. So as you move your satellite further away, your satellite will travel more slowly.